discussion on principles of neurorehabilitation uh, with a presentation by Martina, followed by Claudia, followed by Belen. Oh, okay. So Martina, then followed by Belen, followed by Claudia. Okay, I'm on now. Um, the idea is to also keep it very much discussion oriented. So also with our with our guests, um, and we try to structure it in a way that we try to highlight really some, if you want, challenges, contentious issues, and hidden assumptions that require further discussion. Okay. So Martina, take it away. All right. So I think. So we thought of like giving you some of the latest insights that we had in our work that we did with stroke patients mainly. Um, so this was clinical work that has been done in the last, let's say, two years. And I would like just to give you some highlights of the results we found. And I hope also to be able to explain you well uh, what was the rationale behind it and how that led us to find uh, principles that we think apply um, the results that we found. And I really would like to invite you if you have any comments or suggestions or like especially from your expertise to tell us like, oh, it's, you know, have you ever checked this or did you look at that or that doesn't make sense. Um, so uh, the first thing I would like to present is work that we did um, in cognitive rehabilitation. Um, so uh, the aim of that training was um, that we saw that cognitive deficits are very prevalent in people with stroke. So a lot of people suffer from cognitive deficits afterwards. And also a lot of people will suffer from um, mood disorders or depression. And there has been a lot of work done, so we're not the only ones looking into that. There have been a lot of attempts to rehabilitate those people um, and, and, and help them to, you know, achieve recover. Um, however, the evidence for it is, is not that evident. So if we look at meta-analysis that looks at good effects of cognitive deprivation, we don't really see a clear conflict. Right? And also, therefore, not a clinical um, consideration or, or, or a promotion for, for a certain type of therapy. And we were thinking, why, why is that the case? Why is this happening? Um, Um, so what we thought, what, what, what could be the what could be the reason that there is no evidence for a specific cognitive rehabilitation or for a specific training for stroke patients is that um, that and we, we heard that yesterday. So patients typically don't don't express um, a deficit in one single cognitive domain. So you rarely see a patient that has <coughs> a memory issue. You often see that correlated with other types of cognitive deficits, such as attention issues or spatial awareness problems or executive dysfunctioning. And if you then go on and say, like, oh, so uh, take a population of patients who have memory issues and just train memory, you're neglecting the other um, cognitive deficits they had. Maybe that's the reason why they don't recover, because actually these. Um, yeah, mental uh, or these cognitive abilities, they're not so separate from each other, right? If you think about them. Um, and also, um, I think this, uh, it's a very strong factor is that often mental disorders, when you take patients and you test them, you know, on cognitive tests, right? And you see, oh, you know, they score low. If you don't take mental problems into account, then the low scoring might be not because they have a uh, cognitive deficit. But it could be because they have a depression that is also going on that we know and that we heard ha today as well, um, that they just score lower because they also have a mental depression that has not been diagnosed, because that's also a big issue. Mental disorders are not something that is regularly checked in the hospital. Um, <laughs> and it's only like looked at it when it's very apparent. So someone has a severe depression, um, prevalence, that they look in it and they give uh, rehabilitation, but there's also softer, smooth swings that this patient might face, and these things might go un undetected. Um, so, and and this is not that yeah, you know, like so maybe that doesn't matter. It does matter. 
So we know that people with uh, cognitive deficits and people that have depression after a stroke, they recover less, even in their physical ability. So there's a link there. So that is just totally isolated. And um, also we see that they have, um, they score lower in activities of daily living. So they have more problems in, 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 in going back to life, finding a job, for instance, again, or even interacting with their environment, interacting with their environment. And also that, that puts pressure on, the, on, on their environment, right? So because if you have a depressive border that doesn't get diagnosed, then it gets very difficult to interact with those people uh, later when they're going home. Um, so we wanted to, to look into this. So how, what can we do in, in our rehabilitation, in, in rehabilitation? How could we address those challenges? Um, and one idea was, well, instead of looking one single cognitive deficit in isolation, right? And just training that deficit or provide training for it, like memory training or attention training. Why don't we try to train them in conjunction, right? Why don't we train them together? The idea behind that is that, for instance, if you do an executive functioning task, right, you require both, you require memory, so you have to remember the steps you have to do, but you also need the attention to perform the task on the spot, right? Or if you take spatial awareness, that has been thought of being a very um, attentional driven ability, right? So people with uh, spatial neglect, I don't know if you're familiar with that term, but people that only, it's said that you only direct your attention to part of your space, right? You say, well, that has nothing to do with memory, but we think it might do. The literature shows that um, if you don't remember what you have been looking at, why should you direct your attention to it? So we thought, like, can we can can we try to come up with uh, a rehabilitation protocol that would address all those cognitive domains? So we could take a more heterogeneous group of patients, right? We don't have to know priorly what they have, but we could give them a system that trains various cognitive domains in conjunction and adapts to the different cognitive deficits that these people have automatically without us intervening. And also, we wanted to see if um, what, what would be the influence of, of depressive mood on the training on one hand, and on the other hand, um, how much does it influence, uh, for instance, recovery and cognitive um, functioning, or in, this, in the scales that we measure. So the idea was that we adapt, um, uh, that we um, create uh, training scenarios, cognitive training scenarios in virtual reality virtual reality gives us the means to do things automatically we can you know do an algorithm that that, that, that does automatic adaptation and the idea behind it was that um, the adaptation is done on the difficulty level on these training scenarios so we can take elements <coughs> that we think that are um, promoting memory training or that promoting attention training and these elements the difficulty of those elements they adapt automatically to the patient through the system. And then we wanted to see what is the correlation, what is the influence with, with depression. We want to learn we wanted to learn more about that relationship. So this is a training we, we deemed as um, adaptive uh, conjunctive cognitive training shortly at. And the main um, hypothesis behind this was or question that we had does conjunctive training of various cognitive domains uh, lead to an improvement in a heterogeneous group? patients and secondly um, how does depression interact with the impairment that we see and can conjunctive training actually even you know influence the depressive mood so in order to do that um, we developed um, three different cognitive training scenarios um, I'll go through briefly through them um, so they are all in virtual reality. So the patient is uh, facing a computer screen where he has to interact with, and he does so in an embodied fashion, okay? That means that he doesn't click on a mouse to, to do the task. He uses his upper limb movements. The upper limb movements get tracked by a camera, and they are mapped to 
virtual arms. So he sees the past in a first person view, therefore interacts in an embodied fashion with the virtual environment. Um, and in these plays, the fantast, he has to do various, um, has to accomplish <coughs> various different um, yeah, tasks. So the first one is the experience cognitive, which for us was just, um, a, let's say, a, a basic uh, cognitive training. Um, so he has to intercept fears. So there's fears moving towards the patient, and he has to intercept them, move, move, uh, moving the, the arm that wants to intercept them accordingly. And he is asked to only intercept those that are shown by the color cone above. So now for instance, the next one he has to hit is the blue sphere. And then after that, he has to hit the um, a green sphere, and then an orange one, and to repeat. But he has to remember by itself in, in which order of the sequence he is in. So we have here um, a basic uh, attention and memory training because he has to pay attention to the colors that are sphering and he has to remember uh, in which point in the sequence he is. <coughs> here we don't have any adaptive difficulty because he wanted to use it as a basic measure of how the patient can perform. Also to see if motor impairment will, will not allow him to that properly because that's one of the issues that you can maybe think yeah maybe he just performs badly in those tasks because <coughs> he cannot move and so we wanted to see that no patients can move and they they can accomplish the task uh, the second one is a we call the stars collector um, scenario and here the patient is shown a, a constellation of stars that what you see and um, in this in this star's um, constellation, a sequence of stars lights up. For instance, here there are three stars, and they light up in a given order. He has to observe it, and he has to keep that that order in his memory, in his memory. And then, after a delay period, so he's shown a, a signal, after which he has to represent the sequence of the stars by touching them with his arm accordingly. So, for instance, one, two, three. All right. And when he does that correctly, he's given a point. And when he does it incorrectly, he's shown where he did the mistake. All right. So this is for us um, a working memory alert task. Um, it also is a memory delay to recall task because you have to store store the, the sequence during a, a time. But also is a spatial attention training because what we can do here, and that's why this is individualized and why this is adaptive is that we can, of course, uh, modulate all those factors. So we can make the, um, the, the constellation more extent, for instance, if they cover more space. We can make it more complex, so there's more stars or less stars. We can change the, the amount of stars you have to remember and how long you have to store them in memory. So there's various components that we can modulate and that the system actually adapts to the performance of the patient. Then the third uh, task that we are having that we call the quality controller task. Here, the, patent, the patient is facing uh, a dual task paradigm. So he has two workspaces. He has the left uh, workspace where um, a, a machine, a candy machine, we call it, is producing candies or little cakes or ice cream. And they, when the machine produces them, they fall down and they move over a conveyor belt. And the, the patient sees on the top, um, the top part of the screen which candy or ice cream the machine is currently producing. But we always say to the patient, well, the machine is a bit stupid. It makes mistakes. And sometimes it produces a candy or a, a, an ice cream that shouldn't be there. And if the patient spots that, he has to push it away from the conveyor belt. On the uh, right-hand side of the screen, the patient sees um, donuts that are cooked in a fryer and this donut should not get burned. So um, he, he hear, hears a sizzling sound, he sees um, that the donut's getting brown and when he hears a clock and that's the sign for him to tell him they're ready, he has to move the arm towards the fryer and make them jump out of the fryer. If he doesn't uh, comply so, the donuts get burned and he hears like, oh, and when he does those tasks correctly, he gets points. Uh, if he make, makes mistakes, 
he gets minus points. Um, so this for us, um, we think that this task is training uh, attention because you have to divert your attention to both sides of the screen. You have to constantly monitor what you're doing. Um, but also, it's dual tasking and memory because you have to keep in mind what, what you have to do because this is, a, and for us this sounds trivial, but for patients this can be a real challenge because I don't know if you, you know, but there's also a distractor, there's a beam that flies around. A lot of people get very quickly distracted and then they forget what they have to do. And again, we have the spatial layout, so we train spatial awareness. And also here we can um, modulate or adapt different um, aspects to uh, the performance of the patient. So we can increase or decrease the speed of the movement of the canvas over the conveyor belt. We can um, change um, the ratio of which these canvas are changing, so they can change more faster, or they can, um, you know, there can be longer sequences of the same candy, so we can kind of uh, habituate it to it. Um, also, for the donuts, we can um, make the time they take to cook longer, or they cook faster, so it has to actually move and react faster. Um, yeah, I think that's the elements that we can change here. And so these three um, uh, scenarios, uh, they were played together uh, in one session, so that's for us one session. Each of them takes roughly 10 minutes to do, so in total there's 30 minutes training. And we tested that in a group of stroke patients. We had 30 stroke patients in the end. Uh, 15 of them were in the experimental group training with that system. Um, and they trained during six weeks, um, five days a week, all right? And we had a control group that did, we call it standard therapy, but it's, it's a kind of, because it's uh, chronic stroke patients that are community dwelling, so we were thinking what, what would be the right standard to take. And since it's a small study right now, um, we took, um, we, we gave the control group um, a folder with standard cognitive training tasks, which were like puzzles, crosswords, uh, find, find the errors in pictures, which a normal, like, which a normal psychologist would give them as well to train at home. So they were giving a folder with 30 different types of um, tasks, and they have to take that home, and every day, during 30 minutes, they have to solve those tasks. And after the, the, the six weeks intervention, they would give the ta their folder with the, um, the task that they did, the pencil task, back, back to us. How, how do you control that they really do it? Yeah, so the <laughs> we did not control that they do that they adhere to the training in that sense. So we did not do calls, like you know, that would be one way to call them or go by and see how they do it. Um, because we felt like the training that the, con the, the that the experimental group is doing, we don't really check for adherence either. So the, it's done in the hospital. The experimental group is in the hospital, but what the therapist is doing, they sit them in front of the computer, they make sure that the system works, and then they, they leave him alone. So even a, a, a group, the people in the experimental group were not checked if they would actually, you know, do the training as we asked them to do. So we have um, a, a log file from the... Exactly, so we, yeah, have, the log we file. have the log file. So we can check here and after how they did the task, um, how much did they move, um, have, do they have fluctuations in, you know, in, in performance and things like that? Yeah, but that's post hoc. So on online, we did not check. No. I mean, why don't you? Uh, I mean, the easiest would be to have these tasks in a kind of online yeah, environment exactly. and to ask them to do this half an, uh, half an hour every day, exactly. and then you have yeah. a full control. Yeah. You have a performance mm -hmm. measurement. Then you have a better control yeah. as compared to a three D, yeah. uh, as compared to what you have yeah. now, because otherwise you don't know if the adherence mm -hmm. is low. You have no proper control mm. condition yeah. anymore. So yeah, that would be the next step. So that's a learning. Wait, there's a problem with that because you cannot call that standard treatment because you start to do something that people usually don't do. So then you first have to validate that control condition. Right, but you right. still need to uh, make sure there is a standard treatment. But if they don't adhere to it, then there is no standard treatment as well in your control condition. So, so third, to, to, to make sure, you either need to well, the alternative would be to invite them. I understand the problem, but, mm -hmm. but in solving the problem, you create a new problem. I mean, the ideal situation would be, of course, to invite them, the control group, to the center and to let them do these tasks at the center. Mm -hmm. That would be the perfect control condition because then you have the adherence, you have the control, 
and you know that they get the standard treatment. Mm -hmm. but yeah. If the standard yeah. treatment means transportation to the clinic and, and session there and back home, and that's actually not done usually, then it's not standard treatment. That's so a standard treatment also includes lack of adherence. That's so in some sense you really don't want to touch that. You want to do what they <coughs> usually do in that context. I see all the problems mm. that there are with that, and we try to solve those, but there are no easy solutions here. So, so the control condition is supposed to be standard treatment. What's standard treatment? Okay, that's whatever they do. This is what they do in this specific clinic we work with. Right? So, okay, so you're stuck with that. With, with, with all the problems that are associated with it. Right? Yeah, so I think like the field is really now like in its infancy, let's say. Um, you gotta speak up, but I'm just still there. For instance, uh, it's not clear whether higher intensity or frequency of training will lead to uh, higher recovery. So there are many things we don't know. So um, one question would be, uh, can we convert this to a control, to a control that is treatment as usual, with what they get right now? Or, uh, yes? Mm -hmm. So um, it would depend on the question we are asking, right? Because for instance, one, one question we could ask is, uh, if we augment the intensity of the training, will this have some benefits? Maybe no, right? So a treatment as usual control would, would be uh, an acceptable control. So I think it's very difficult to give things control in the field of rehabilitation. And also there are so many things we don't know that this is unacceptable uh, control if we interpret then the results properly, right? Like for instance, we could say in, in case of lack of adherence of a control group that is receiving treatment as usual, which is at the chronic stage nothing, do we have an impact delivering certain level of train, training? This is not known right now. So, like, is it clear? Yeah, yeah no, no, it's totally clear. It's just more from a conceptual point mm -hmm. of view. If you want to communicate that you have improving the treatment in that specific center mm -hmm. as compared to their standard procedures, then that is the right protocol. If you want to make the claim that your tasks improve the outcome as compared to standard training tasks, then you need to control for adherence. And if you don't do yeah, that, you're... Okay, but that's the important distinction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but, yeah, but right. also the problem is that you don't have standards. Yeah. So... And also the standards are not validated. Like there are so many problems in this field. For instance, uh, the standards right now for motor uh, rehabilitation, that is my expertise, but also for cognitive mapping, I would say. In, in the case of motor is occupational therapy. And occupational therapy is a type of treatment that was never validated then. So that's the standard and the control group that's being used in this chart for an active control group. But there's no evidence that this is beneficial. It could be detrimental. And then it would not so, be a good control group, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, these issues are, you know, I mean, first of all, it's, it's a very nice idea. It's a very nice set of tasks. Um, and the kind of issues that you guys are discussing now is the usual discussion of rehabilitation trials, okay? Which, you know, which is, um, Maybe I, I like to maybe move the discussion on a slightly more theoretical point, okay? So um, here you're taking a snapshots of, uh, first of all, you know, I don't believe that we have memory, attention, executive control. You know, those are the list of William James chapter of his book. And since then we've been using these domains as a way to think about cognitive neuroscience, which is a nonsense. The brain is not, doesn't do memory, doesn't do yeah. attention. Mm -hmm. The brain does, you know, the brain survives, you yeah. know. So, so here you got three scenarios of survival, let's call it this way. And of course, <clears throat> uh, the problem here is being an automatic, well structured control, et cetera, et cetera. And this is a major problem in rehabilitation is that when you're training something specific, right, this particular scenario, particular survival scenario, then you might get better on the survival scenario, but you don't get better in real life. Generalization, yeah. okay? And that's an unavoidable problem. So I think clearly here, you know, one way to improve this potentially would be to develop as many backgrounds, as many, and this could be done, generalized at least yeah. the environment, okay? 
But then the other thing is, is variability. And you're taking people with cognitive disorders as they have one thing, cognitive disorders, and even multi-domain cognitive disorders. And I think what you could do here inside this particular scenario of three tasks, you could try to map individual variability of control subjects and find some psychophysical thresholds of what are the limits of capacity of 100 healthy subjects of this task as you're manipulating your control yeah. parameters. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I think once you get a patient, you can do some, maybe some thresholds, so to speak, and find out where this patient is falling in the variability cloud of yeah. this yeah. in yeah. the different tasks. Yeah. And, and I think then now you have something more principal on how to train yeah. these patients. Mm -hmm. Because right now you're changing the parameters kind of ad hoc and you don't know what you're changing. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and instead, there might be a landscape of performance variability, <coughs> which may then potentially divide up clusters of subjects, yeah. because some subjects might be better at the executive control task, mm -hmm. other might be better at the spatial mm -hmm. attention task. And so I yeah. think that landscape yeah. it can provide, and I think this can be done in healthy subjects. Yeah. You know, you take all your students here and you just test them for, you know, two, three yeah, hours. Yeah. And yeah, I think- the But the cool thing is, you're making a bunch of predictions now, and we actually did the experiment. Okay. So we can now look at <laughs> your predictions yeah. are confirmed. No, right, but I think you need to be... It's, it's, it describes perfectly what, what we would like to do as, yeah. as an outcome of what we do now. Because it, what you're saying is absolutely right. right? You, you, you took assumptions. For instance, where is the upper and the lower limit for, for this to train? Or, um, you know, that will modulate these things. But through the, through the interaction with the patient, we have to learn about those. We, we, this is a priority assumption we have to take now because it has not been done before. But um, you're absolutely right. We, we should, you know, I would envision like a, a psychometric map, right? Yes. It gives us different curves for different features. Um, I have to say, so here we only have 30 patients, and that's why we couldn't go to. Well, but that's why I would go with healthy subjects. Yeah, with healthy we could do well, wait, wait, no, Martina, no. you're caving in much too quickly. I really disagree, completely, okay. because actually we are exactly substantiating the point you make with these results. We show that this positional distinction between different domains actually doesn't hold, or what did this patient do? That's an important insight, because the point is... the next slide. It is... <laughs> Oh yeah, we haven't seen the results. Yeah. So, but, but We're having a theoretical discussion. Yeah, that's why, that's yeah. why I'm jumping ahead now, because <laughs> before we, we start to draw conclusions, we should look at the data. Okay, and yes. the data will help us to sort okay. of position ourselves yeah. in this discussion. But in the end, what's important here, everything is based on hypothesis testing. And we started with very well-defined hypotheses that we tested in very explicit scenarios, and we found something. Some things were confirmed, other things were rejected, other things were surprises. With that, you have to the next step on the stairs you're building. And now, okay, we're gonna test the next hypothesis. But you cannot march into the field of neuroimplantation saying, well, everything you've done is bullshit, they know distinct domains, and now I'm gonna give them something different. We still have to deal with the standards in that field. And that's what we're doing. We have to go very systematic and very, very specific. Right? So let's look at the data. Uh, yeah, so uh, just to, so we, I can uh, explain, explain the data well that we're showing. We have, we have before the six weeks, after the six weeks, and three months, uh, three months follow up. We had a we had a, a test battery um, of cognitive tasks uh, tests um, um, that we then could like test each domain that we were addressing. Okay. Um, yeah. So first, just to see that. Uh, so the patients we had, so how they were recruited. Maybe that's interesting to see. Um, so we had in the end. 30 patients, okay? We, recruit, we, we asked about 60, 59 patients if they wanted to participate. And after screening and going through the whole um, uh, yeah, experimental uh, protocol, we ended up with having 30 people. And the inclusion criteria was uh, to, to, to have a mocha scale be below um, 26, all right? That was the inclusion criteria for having a cognitive impairment. We're not looking where the impairment was. We just took the more corporate scale. And it's very interesting to see that even in these 30 people that we're having, if we later look um, at, the co at the cognitive test battery, 
and those domains and to say whether they were uh, they had no impairment in that domain or they had a mild um, moderate or uh, severe impairment then we see that first of all that uh, 10 patients had all domains impaired okay or had problems in all the domains we tested for let's put it that way uh, and then we only had like two that had no domain or had no problems in those domains that we tested in the uh, best test strategy all the rest actually uh, have had had either multiple uh, like the majority had multiple uh, issues in various domains and that's very interesting that even in a very small sample we already see a quite distribution of domains impaired um, and, it's, and it goes with what we see in bigger studies as well so I guess our sample was selected well but actually not selected so that's interesting to see a very heterogeneous group already a quite strong pattern for this and also the so on the on the right hand side we see um, the severity uh, per domain and it's also very varied right so we have in each of the domains um, a quite a nice distribution of from, from low to severe impairment right so we have a really heterogeneous group and that is very representative of what we would see in a typical community dwelling chronic stroke patient uh, environment And this is just to show um, what we got from the system. Um, so what you see here is... You have a laser pointer on that, right? Do I have you got a green button on top. Um, so um, as I told you before, we had these two scenarios that adapted to the, the difficulty of individual parameters to the, to the ability of the patient. And you see in the this part here is the star constellation one, and this part, these two panels here are what they call it. So you see here um, the the difficulty level that was achieved uh, by the different um, uh, patients. You see it over the people put together for one to two weeks, three to four weeks, five to six weeks, all right? And it's split by the severity that they have in the spatial awareness domain, all right? Because we thought that. Um, Star constellation actually has a very heavy component on spatial awareness. It's, it's scanning and it's very visual. And you see which which complexity of star constellation, which expansion they reach. And we can see that the red ones are the severely impaired ones, and the uh, the green ones are the ones that were not impaired in the spatial awareness. And you see first of all that they are very diverse, right? So we have that the severe ones actually have very simple star constellation achieved, especially in the beginning, then they increase a bit, they get uh, a bit more difficult to achieve. And the, the mild or non-impaired ones, they have a higher difficulty level, so they have more complex stars constellation they have to solve, all right? And there's, you know, a trend to be going upward during the training. Um, then what we wanted to see, like, so what that, how does that influence the success rate? One beauty of our system is, and I forgot to explain that before, is that uh, the, the adaptive mechanism that we are using, so the parameters that you know are changing automatically according to the performance, what we say is that performance should be around 70%, because that's what we measure as being the optimal performance level. So it's never too easy, but it's never too hard either. So you're in an optimal flow. That's, I don't like that term much but it's what it's being called and we see that despite of the severity level people perform around 70 percent so it doesn't matter if you're like performing on a low level it's a system that helps you to, to, to set the threshold for the um for the difficulty correctly so you have an optimal flow or an optimal experience right to train an optimal and there's there's not a difference actually in the end there's no difference anymore okay and it's kept Here's the same for the quality controller. Here we took the, um, the impairment they had in executive functioning, and we compared it to the speed of the conveyor belt, how fast it came to move. And we see, again, similar picture, right? So we have, here we didn't have someone that was severe in the experimental group, and we have moderate to none. We see a, a very big spike in the beginning, 
have an increase in bronze dance, they should train on higher difficulty levels. And again, the success rate is, is really narrow. So independent of how, like what we can take home from here is independent of how severely impaired you are, the system will help you to achieve the same performance level. So it gives you the same experience of, of I'm, I'm performing optimally, right? which is a positive reinforcement. And that shows that the parameters we set here, we see that it's a bit higher than here. So actually it's a bit higher than here. So here's about 70 to 80%, which we, we expected here. You see it's going up to almost to 90 for some of them. So this would tap into what you said, that maybe the parameters that we just set, like upper low bound, might be there for some people to be not as challenging. And this way we can learn now from that data set. I mean, the other thing that is uh, maybe evident, but maybe you need a few more subjects, is uh, <clears throat> that there is an additive effect in the attention task, but there seems to be an interaction in the executive task. Mm -hmm. So usually, you know, people improve in an additive fashion. fashion. Mm -hmm. So if you start high, mm -hmm. you end up normal. If you start low, you end up with moderate deficits. There are very few crossovers. Mm. It's very rare so that you find someone that is going okay. low and yeah. now it's going to become normal. Mm. So it's always like so. It's shifting in advance. It's shifting yeah. upwards, yeah. basically. And the first curve there between the severe and the mild shows, you know, kind of an additive effect mm. over time of training. Now, here it's interesting that in the executive task, yeah. it seems to be that the severe ones have a steeper slope mm. than the mild yeah, ones. Yeah. So that's an interactive effect. Mm -hmm. Because it's not additive, basically the you know the, the moderate, yeah. the severe ones, it seems to yeah. improve most. Yeah. And of course, yeah. in both cases, the variability is shrinking between yeah. the, the time yeah. one in your mm -hmm. estimation of the thresholds mm -hmm. to the time three. In both tasks, there is a shrinking of the variability, mm -hmm. which is given by the severe patients. patients that, you know, the the severe patient more, they became more mm -hmm. consistent, which is also interesting. Yeah, uh, it's interesting. And actually, yeah. it's what we would see in in motor rehabilitation as well, right? Where so there's, there seems to be the threshold, like uh, Bella can tell us that more. So uh, it depends how much you still can recover, right? So if you're already good, then there's also not much you, sh you have right. to recover, right? If you have none, then this is merely an entertainment thing, as they say. Huh? But uh, the more severity you have, the more recovery potential you still have. And that's something we still need to find out, like in cognitive and in motor. What is the recovery? How much can we potential drive? Yeah, how much can we use the, the potential recovery? And how can we optimally um, push that, right? Because, especially for the severe ones, this is a real issue because there's a lot of data showing that if, you, if you're really severe, then you actually lost the pain. You shouldn't spend time on them because they're severe and they will never, they will never recover. And maybe that's something that, you know, if you want to add to that. Maybe. Uh, we can, we can talk about more. I guess the other thing in, in terms of the adaptive thresholds, now here we're expanding, but Amy Bastian has shown that in the motor system, for instance, when you are training on the, say, on a, on a treadmill, something that really helps is to have, uh, for instance, walking backwards or having the two treadmill being mm -hmm. controlled oh, independently. independently. So you keep adjusting, basically, you're not walking. You cannot predict. There is a lot of unpredictability mm -hmm. built in. And of course, that idea that you're training predictive pattern, but also unpredictive patterns, mm -hmm. uh, su suggests that you're expanding your parameter space. Mm -hmm. Hence, you're maybe allowing for a broader and more generalized recovery. Mm -hmm. And so here, again, you could maybe play with the thresholds mm -hmm. and with the ad adaptive technique maybe try to expand not just the performance mm -hmm. but maybe but also expand the, also the variability yeah. you know which is kind yeah, of yeah. what we're trying mm -hmm. to yeah. absolutely yeah. Uh, all right we're going to the depression uh, link uh no first i want to sugar cane for the solids and then i will so because we were <laughs> yeah. to speed up a little bit right oh, so right. Should, I yeah, thought yeah, so I we should really go to okay, the right. highlights so um, and i think it's important to show the depression link and okay. also if you can a little bit the validation gate. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, just a quick, um, we found some patient in three out of the cognitive domains tested. So we saw a small increase in the attention domain, spatial awareness, 
and the generalized Hamilton function, which is, a, is an overall measure that we have. It's not, it's not, there are not strong results. Um, um, there are not, you know, there's no big differences, okay? Um, but we, we already see we have huge variability, and in a small sample size like this, um, this has to be taken into precaution. It's just for us to see, okay, um, there is there's something there, all right? There's something there. It could be due to small sample size, it could be due to higher var variability, but I think it's a more sample size that we can do more categorization and then uh, we might see something. But it, it gives us hope, let's say. Um, do you have any kind of activities of daily life, of daily living? No, we didn't have that because the battery itself was already so, so long. It was the battery itself took almost yeah, an hour to complete and we didn't want to add. And then we had <coughs> rear rotor, we had, we had bark limpets, but there was nothing there. Bark was also the main activity, there was nothing. Um, we had the MMSC just to see if it was there. So no, we didn't do that. Uh, but we had for uh, for soup food with our patients, we had the depression scale, the Hamilton depression scale available. And that made us uh, curious because what we saw is that uh, the experiment in group um, would improve quite differently or than the, the, the control group. I mean, you see here is that the control group after the training, so if we take uh, after the training measure like this data, we see they get actually worse. Now we can put that, put that to the home training. But we see that's a group difference. And we see that at three months follow up, the depression group goes back to, to zero, basically. But the, they still keep the mean being different. So the, the experiment group keeps on you know, getting improving. And that made us a bit curious, like what, what's going on here? Like, why do we see something here? Uh, and why is it distinct between the two groups, all right? So uh, we had, unfortunately, another measurement in uh, as an assessment tool which is called what we call the validation gate. We added that because um, this is a task. Well, I maybe show you, then you understand what I mean. So what the patient is asking, uh, there's circle moving in a linear fashion on the, over the screen. And whenever there's one of the circle makes a small displacement, a small jump, the person has to press a button, all right? And we can increase cognitive load. So we can, first there's one circle moving, then there's six circle moving, and then there's another task that the person has to listen to sentences and also report whether they're right or wrong. What do you mean? I will show it to you now how it looks like. And when you see a circle jumping, I want you to raise your hand, all right? Very good. Everybody's still awake. <laughs> so this is what the person is doing. And that's a very interesting task because we have, for one hand, the conscious report is whether you saw the jump or not. And we can measure how, how big the jump has to be for you to be reported and whether that changes with increasing cognitive load. We can also visualize that because we can we can record the eye movement. We can we have a, an eye track so we can see what the person is looking at, and we can um, yeah plot you know um, what you have been um, what you have been reporting and what you not have been reporting in a representative space. And this is interesting because it, 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 it's an interaction between, between two, um, let's say, uh, cognitive aspects, all right? Because on one hand, you have the prediction space. So if something moves in a linear, linear fashion, you expect it to continue moving in that fashion, all right? So, uh, and then when it violates that prediction, you might report it. But what happens is when with increasing cognitive flow, this displacement has to be increasingly bigger for you to notice. It's because uh, the attention is getting affected. It's attention resources which are in your job for you, so your prediction space becomes bigger. Jumps have to be bigger for you to be noticing. And it's a very beautiful task to see how people, first of all, cope with or, um, um, cognitive load. But since it's a, it's, a, it's a cognitive task, we thought like, well, maybe we can see something in, in our cognitively impaired people. We want to see how they behave in that task, right? And we first saw nothing, but then we looked at the people that were depressed. So we see that, oh, okay. 
Can you just clarify when you say people were depressed? Were they really depressed, or did so anybody of them meet criteria so for depression? Yeah, so yeah, um, so I, I can show you this. So you see here, this um, the x-axis is the is the scale on the depression, high mental depression scale. Okay, the cutoff is by six. They're very safe. Actually, those six you have no depressive disorder. They do, but they're, let's call it depressive mood signs, signs for depressive mood. Above six, you will show increasing signs of depression. Right? And I think the maximum is, I don't know, maximum. 11, 11, 11. Yeah. 10, yeah. 20 or something. Um, so we see here, like, I think that's what's the line. You see it here, it's supposed to be the cut of that. No depressed, it's depressed. So what's interesting now is that when we plot, you know, the response proportion to how many of the jumps did you report? Okay? And you see here, this is where only one circle was present. Here was when there were uh, six circles present, and here when you had another task, so you had to listen, all right? So increasing listening. We see that it correlates, well, like if there's no correlation when there's only one circle with the Hamilton score, because it performed equally well, that it is something that's not correlated, but with low and high, it becomes correlated with the depressive, the, the, the depression scale score, all right? This is interesting because you see that they get all of them get worse. So you have it's not that the the non depressed ones are, are are always good. So you have that they also get worse, but there's a correlation. So if the more depressed you are, the worse are you performing that task. And it's the conscious button, the conscious button pressing. When we look at you know strategic behavior, so whether you would fatigue towards that target, which we assume is like you have noticed actually. Unconsciously, you have noticed that there was a jump. You see no correlation. All right. So this is puzzling because it means that the the, the people, regardless of their depression level, have succeeded towards the jump that the little displacement, but they seem to be la less able or they were less yeah aware of like yeah. then making the button press. And it has nothing to do with their we check there was nothing to do with their physical ability. It's not related with any other cognitive deficit. Right? Well, we have shown them previously this dissociation, right, between the, the conscious choice mm -hmm. and the surprise. Mm -hmm. right? So that dissociation is confirmed, but now you see this, this interaction with the press. Mm -hmm. right? I was say, I mean, how many times do you press the button without circadian? Um, so, I mean, it, you can do the task if it's more or less central. Yeah, you can do it with with, with your eyes still. Exactly. So um, <coughs> we have here. Uh, we took only those. Um, so in, in our previous yeah. study, where we really calibrated this task on healthy subjects, right, okay. we see a, see a very strong dissociation of increase in cognitive load that affects the conscious choice, but not the surprise. You have less circad, which is true. Um, yeah, but also here again. The field of view was yeah. maybe somewhat different because of the yeah. observations and so yeah. on, right? Yeah. yeah, you probably want to look at the visual angle of your target. Yeah. Yeah, to see whether they, they can do it without mm. circadian. Yeah. Well, it's, it's true. I can't really check. It's true that you could potentially. So you have to speak up. I'm just yeah. for that. It's true that you could potentially detect the jumps <coughs> circadian to the location because it was tuned such that the jumps do not occur outside of a certain current fixing or current gaze position because we didn't want the jumps to occur uh, outside of what you can detect. So if it, if it jumps outside of where you can see then you wouldn't circuit because you wouldn't even detect it in the peripheral vision whereas if it were within the peripheral vision you, you had a chance of circuiting to, to, to kind of attend to the, to the circle more than the rest. I mean I guess my point is that if you don't need to circuit to do the task <coughs> why would you circuit anyway? As in, like, yeah. um, I mean, do you have any kind of complaints with this? Because I would assume from depression, from, from a depressed patient, mm -hmm. that they just don't care. They see the uh, jump, they Not just are they less inclined to respond to but it they, because they're less I motivated. Mean they did, you know, so if there's only one circle moving, they responded. You know, okay, they, this guy, okay, well, like, the difference arises when, when, when they increase the complexity. I mean, it's a correlation of minus 0 0.3, right? Uh, in the no, uh, to the left, the upper left. This one? Yeah. 
That's the R employee. It's no correlation here. Yeah, yeah, but it's an R of minus yeah. 0.3. Yeah. I don't see the number. Yeah, either. it's minus 0 0.3. Yeah. Because your, this is your uh, baseline. Because it's it may be that one is not significant, the other is significant. Basically, it's an R minus 0.3 versus an R minus 0.47. Mm -hmm. It's your null hypothesis is not R of zero. So, because you want to claim that it's specific to this task, yeah. and basically it tells you that actually they show this effect also in the easy condition, mm -hmm. but in the easy yeah. condition may they be, may, be, may still be a bit more motivated mm -hmm. than that. So basically, normally you would need to compare uh, to show that in the easy condition they perform normally. Mm -hmm. And relative to the easy condition, they suddenly start to show this deficit. Yeah, I mean, you see the, you know, like one, like here to y axis is is the is the response proportion. So the one would be like perfect here, okay. mm -hmm. and you see that yes, in the higher depression there is like more variability. I would mm -hmm. say, yeah, um, but I would say like it's so it's it's still. Fairly equal to what a non-depressed person would be doing. Right, right again, but it's just again. It shows you the same trend. Imagine you would have now. I don't know where the significant threshold starts. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's like saying, okay, in the easy condition, you have an R of minus 0.45, mm -hmm. and in the it's a P of 0 0.06, and in the uh, hard condition, you just pass the significance threshold. Mm -hmm. So you need to compare these two conditions to each other, mm -hmm. uh, and not to the zero, because otherwise, it's kind of like yeah. Of course, with the more uh, mm -hmm. when you have when you add more complexity, you have more um, variance. Mm -hmm. the, your correlation coefficient get can get higher because mm -hmm. you have a kind of um, quite a large um, yeah, basically mm -hmm. plateau plateauing because all of them perform perfectly. Mm -hmm. So the correlation coefficient is kind of like yeah. limited by, by the, the by, by the, by the, the high performance the of everybody. Yeah. Even though, because the correlation is not only driven by the high mm. depression group, but also by the low depression group, mm. and in the low depression group, you also see they are all plateauing at one or well, mm. most of them, yeah. and in the high depression group, uh, the variance is getting just larger. Mm. Mm. Yeah. But what is I think important here is, is on the one end it, it speaks to this issue that Mauricio mentioned earlier. They see that overlap between domains that were traditionally segregated, right? In this case, affective state for mood and, and cognitive performance. Plus, what we're trying to validate here is, let's say, a sort of more objective assessment of cognitive performance using more psychophysical tests, right? So you don't depend on a mini-mental state assessment, which is notoriously really low resolution and subjective, right? So this, this is the two things we're trying to address here. And I think as your initial, the initial results are, let's say, promising, but as always, there is sort of more work to be done. Um, so, Martina, do we have more surprises or shall we move to Valencia? Yeah? Really. Okay. Really. Great. Thank you, Martina. That was great. from a study we ran uh, with basics, basic patients. Uh, it, it, uh, Gary will talk about it later, it's a great study. So um, this is a patient that actually was a cute patient uh, that presented hemiparesis and aphasia, right? As you see, the lesion is expands towards the uh, premotor and primary motor cortices. And what happens after a stroke or a lesion, right? So just some minutes after the lesion, structural damage is already visible. And after that, impairments start appearing. So in this case, aphasia uh, and hemiparesis. And when I started in science, Paul told me, if we understand how the brain works, we will be able to repair broken brains, right? So how many of you agree with this? <laughs> okay. So I'm, I'm going to try to convince and you that that's... I will tell you, this goes back to Jean-Baptiste Vico. <laughs> Wachte mit Perum Convertitum. 
Okay. Of effect are so reversible. That's even. <coughs> oh, it's not the same sentence, but okay. But uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to try to convince you that that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Okay. Let's hear Good. it. So, <laughs> you don't have words, right? Just, I need the dongle to do that. Sorry, yeah. Right. They need the adapter, so okay. I will just push the key and just go on. Okay, I don't have it, so it's fine. Um, so this is, the, this is the journey of a patient, okay? Stroke occurs, there is a first stage in which the patient is hospitalized. Um, some impairments appear, okay? We can talk about sensory impairments, uh, communication, for like, Basia, uh, motor impairments, many possible uh, problems that may emerge. At this point, the patient starts receiving therapy, and the patient may recover certain level of function. Some of them may not recover at all. Indeed, uh, data shows that one third of these patients who present, for instance, hemiparesis, are non responders. They just don't respond to therapy. The other, it may be linked to some, um, that the lesion may have affected corticospinal connectivity. So in this case, it seems there is a connection also for lower limbs, but it's not really accepted right now, uh, totally in, in the field. But let's say that there are one third of these patients that are not responding. The other two thirds recovered quite well. Actually, data shows that uh, there is a, a rule seems to apply to all these patients, that is the proportionality rule. They recover about 70% of what they, lo what they lost due to the lesion. Okay. And this is what we call, but proportional, recovery is proportional, okay? But then uh, the patient continues to train and keeps on recovering during the outpatient phase until around three to 12 months, it, it depends. Right? It depends on the, the level of function that the patient achieves, also the country and the policies in the country. No, no, no. Ah, it's, ah, it's Thank you. Thank you. So that's great. For instance, in Spain, they stay around one year, but we can move to other countries where they stay months. And it doesn't matter at which point is the patient. He may need further recovery, but he's still discharged from the hospital, goes back home, and does not receive any more care which leads to a progress that may be related to this early discharge. And it's uh, the deterioration. Okay, and I end up about structure, but not explain. So one of the principles we talked about is recovery is proportional. And another one that does not need to be related to that one is recovery is structure compliant. And the mechanisms that are supporting each of these two rules or patterns that we identified may be different, okay? may not be the same. So proportional, they recover 70% of what they, what they lost. Structured in time, they recover more the earlier they are from the lesion. So at the acute stage, just after the lesion, they recover more. And at the chronic stage, when they are discharged already, they are at home, when they're later, they recover less. Why? We don't know, okay? But that's a, that's a pattern. So after they are discharged, there is a progressive deterioration of function, and this is reported in literature in many countries. And this deterioration is so huge that after four years after the discharge, these patients reach the same level of function. They had uh, around two months after the lesion. Okay, so they they lose a lot of function. They recover during treatment, and this is what we call rehabilitation in vain. So what happened with all these resources we invested in these people? Are for nothing, okay? Then this deterioration, 80% loss, it's linked to the admission, okay? There are some, some, some patients that will have a reoccurrence, so they will have another uh, stroke, so they will be readmitted. Others will, have, will be readmitted due to falls or other problems. So this is the huge puzzle we are trying to solve in the field of rehabilitation. <coughs> so uh, first, we don't know how we can uh, improve this slope. Can they recover faster during that period? Second, we don't know how we can rise this asymptote. Can we convert this 70% recovery 
into 90% recovery, how can we do that? Okay. Then we don't know how we can prevent this deterioration. And we don't know how also we can prevent it. Right? So there are many pieces in the puzzle. But these pieces are talking about how the brain works somehow. And this is where I do not agree with Paul, because I don't think this talks about how the brain works only. It works, it, it talks about how the brain repairs itself. So how a brain that is repairing itself works may be different to how a brain works. A brain that is not repairing itself. Okay. And this is what I want to I want to talk about. I want to convince you about. Can, can I make a kind of a point on that slide? I mean, the line is not really a, a linear progression. The, no. the line is yeah. very steep so up to four to six yeah. weeks, yeah. six to eight weeks, yeah. and then it gets shallower. Yeah. So it's actually, it's really, yeah. uh, you know, it's I, a, I like so it's, it's not linear. So no. I think what you're saying, uh, and I agree with it, is that there is this uh, window of critical opportunity, yes. this critical period, yeah. which they say recapitulate and yeah. then whatever with now in the states for instance you stop rehab at three months yeah okay it's when the critical window they say three it to three to six months yes. and by 12 months when i see patients in the clinic at 12 months they're already deteriorating exactly yes. in, the, in spain you see the deterioration when they stop the rehabilitation at 12 months so okay. the rehabilitation is actually maintaining kind of a you know yes. functional level yes. of yes. higher performance yeah. And then you go back to probably to the level of plasticity that has been achieved yeah. in the first yeah. six weeks. I totally right. agree. Actually, this is wrong. You're right. The curve would do something like this, and then blah right. here. Right? Yeah. So the slope occurs here. That's right. So this is even more surprising, mm -hmm. right? Because they talk about this critical window that is from three to six months, right? And after that, it's just flat. Sh shorter, three months. Yeah, or three months. Yeah. And in, in animals also shorter, right? Like in yeah. mice it has been reported as well. So it looks like it's a mechanism of the brain for repairing itself. And if the brain is in this special state of high plasticity for repairing, does it learn in the same way uh, another brain that is not in that state learns? Well, we don't know actually. So we may learn how a brain learns, but how a brain that is lesion learns may be different. So which are the principles of motor learning and which are the principles of motor recovery? Because they may be different and they may interact as well. Right? So, but so that's what you're saying the same thing with different words, right? Because also from an evolutionary perspective, you would argue that the brain is organized around a limited number of principles, and that these principles also cover how it will deal through insults to the brain. Right? Yeah. So the also the recovery process. Yes. Is, right? so in general, that's how that's the brain works, right. you're right, because okay. how the brain works covers how the brain repairs itself. I knew this was the trick, but it was <laughs> engaging. Exactly. Right? <laughs> you got my attention for sure. <laughs> so, okay, let me just a second. I think I made an error. Okay, so, well, the deterioration is an issue, and we have an idea behind how to solve it. I just mentioned it, but I will not get into details. So, uh, one of the problems after stroke is that these patients, uh, these patients tend to compensate. And they compensate, well, we all compensate, okay? We try to optimize what we do. So if something is difficult, we will find another way to do it. If suddenly one arm is not working, what do you do? You use the other arm. That's how you to compensate. It's, what it's called learn and use. You learn to not use the affected arm. Another way to compensate is, okay, if your arm is working somehow, but it's not working as it was working before. Okay, I will adapt to grab that cup in a different way. So there are different ways of compensa compensation. You can adapt or you can non-use, okay? Uh, this is what we see in patients, but we, saw, we see that uh, a brain that is working properly should do that. Okay, it should compensate, so that's fine. But it leads to problems because if these patients tend to compensate, then they, they engage into a vicious cycle. And this vicious cycle, I will talk more about this uh, on Monday, also uh, supporting it with our studies. 
But in this vicious cycle, what happens is that if the arm is not selected because there's no action selection favoring the use of the arm, then the patient is not exposed to error, there's no learning, and the outcome is poor. Okay, so this, is, this, this happens because the selection of the arm and the learning from error reinforces each other, these two components. Okay, they reinforce each other. So if they don't use it, they lose it, these are principles. And if you use it, then you learn. So these patients lost function and learned that they cannot use this arm. So they're not exposed to this, and the deterioration is progressive. But you can think that if we would reverse this cycle, uh, I don't have it here, but again, the error is having a double, double influence, okay? The error is maximizing learning, okay? But at the same time, it's telling you, don't do that again. So this needs to be in equilibrium. If it's not in equilibrium, you are either in a vicious cycle, or you're favoring the other direction. You're in a virtuous cycle. You're using it more and more, and you're learning more and more. So if you think about this as a model, it's a bistable model. Either you are learning more and more, or you are deteriorating. If we discharge patients that are still in the issue cycle, they are not using enough the affected arm subdominantly, then they will go home, and they will not use the arm. They will de deteriorate progressively. But if we just wait a little bit that they gain some function and we discharge them later, then they will go back home and they will be using spontaneously their affected arm. So they will be engaged in this vicious cycle that just leads to recovery spontaneously. Okay, so now we have a problem. First, we are discharging patients that still did not get into the virtuous cycle. And this predicts deterioration. And the other problem we have is that some patients we have in the clinic are already into the virtuous cycle. Where are we keeping them? They can go home. They can be with their family. They, they will use the arm for feeding, for having a shower. So if we would be able to identify when they cross the threshold from vicious to virtuous cycle, we can know when we can discharge them with no deterioration. So that's the idea we are um, trying to pursue with studies, but I will talk about this on Monday. So if we go back to this puzzle, uh, just to remind you, uh, we talk about proportionality, and we talk about structure in time, and I want to show you uh, some proofs of these two rules, and uh, some proofs that show that the brain is different when it's lesion, it's working differently, and it's learning differently than when it's not lesion. So this is a study that was published some years ago uh, on mice, animals, that is quite uh, interesting because it shows uh, that, well, let me explain you slowly. So uh, they, what they do is they recruit mice and they train them to perform certain uh, motor tasks. Okay, so they just, these mice have to grab something. And after 10 days of training, they induce a lesion. Okay, they do it in the uh, motor cortex and the mind. After that, they keep the mice without restricted mice cannot move, cannot stretch, for eight consecutive days. After that period, they induce a second stroke in an adjacent area, okay? Not in the same one, but in an adjacent one. And now they do not restrict the mice at all, for, for not, not for one, ah, no, sorry, for two days, for two consecutive days. Uh, sorry, I'm saying it wrong. Yeah, okay, so here they do the stroke, the mice cannot move, then it moves again, it recovers a little bit, but you see it doesn't reach the level of function it had before the, the stroke. And after some days, they induce a second stroke in an adjacent area. Now the mice is immobilized for two consecutive days only, so not eight, but two, okay? And it, when it moves again and can train, it reaches the same level of function it had, not only before the second stroke, but also before uh, having the first stroke. So what does this mean? It supports the idea of a pivotal window. So the, this second stroke is reopening a critical window. This second stroke, stroke is uh, inducing this state of high plasticity in the brain that will allow the mice to take profit from moving. And this is the second key. So what's happening here? Those mechanisms that are specific to the lesion brain, that are unique to the lesion brain, and we can talk about axonal sprouting or other mechanisms, 
are taking place here and are interacting with those mechanisms that are specific to motor learning. The mice needs to move in order to recover. It's not enough with opening the critical window to induce a stop, right? So there's where uh, the principles of motor learning uh, kick in. So we need to profit from those mechanisms that are specific to the lesion. So high plasticity, a critical window, but we need to also understand how uh, motor learning occurs, motor learning, cognitive learning. So which are the principles behind this? And here we identify some of them. So there are others, but one of them we have already talked about, which is introducing variability, which promotes the generalization of, of learning. Uh, but also we can talk about practice must, must be mass or task specific, structured in time. So resting periods need to be introduced in intervals and embodied. Okay, so there are many principles we need to explore in order to define how we have to deliver therapy. And at the end of the of the story, what we want to do is to optimize the three pillars of neurobia, which are improvement, retention, and as we were saying before, generalization. So to have an impact in the activities of daily living of patients. And this is the system we are using to implement this therapy, the rehabilitation gaming system, in which we are trying to develop different rehabilitation protocols that are always based on principles. And we did like a, a massive work with this system. For 10 years, we collected data from stroke patients at different stages. And we ended up with a very unique uh, um, uh, data set. Because and we were not actually planning it, but when we looked at all the data we had, we realized that we were exposing these patients to a very um, homogeneous protocol. We were recruiting it then according to the same inclusion criteria, but across our studies, we were recruiting patients from different chronicity, at different chronicity stages. So we ended up with a data set that has patients that initiated therapy at different points after the lesion, but the same exact therapy. And we thought, okay, if we want to investigate how um, recovery is structured in time, we have the perfect data set to do that. We have the perfect data set to explore the critical window. So for instance, right now, we don't know how long is the critical window. We don't know how long it lasts. Some people talk about three months, other people talk about six months. That's not clear. We don't know how fast it fades out. And we don't know how it, which is the shape of this critical window. Let's call it not critical window. Let's call it of this recovery potential, OK? So what we do is we put together all that. and what what surprises us is that we easily see a very clear curve. Okay, this is logarithmic, this, uh, this uh, axis. So you see it linear, but it's not, actually, as we were saying before. Uh, in the beginning, we see a slope that is quite steep going down in the recovery potential of these patients. So this axis is showing the chronicity, the days post stroke. okay? If patients start therapy just after the lesion, they recover, they have a lot of recovery. But if they start the therapy days, many days after the stroke, even six or seven years after the stroke, recovery potential goes down and is quite uh, low. So the question is, okay, so this is showing us, is, is depicting the, the, the critical window, the shape of the critical window, or the shape of this plasticity mechanism that kick in after the lesion and start fading out, right? So let's put it in, in different uh, clusters, and let's see whether uh, we, we can we can run some statistics and see if these clusters are different, right? And the surprise comes when, okay, we see that during the acute stage, just after the stroke, but recovery potential is, is, is high. During the early chronic phase, it's still high, but significantly different from the acute. And even during the late chronic stage, we see recovery potential that is significantly different from early and from acute. So this means that the critical window is longer than what we thought. It goes beyond one year and a half, and we don't know how long it goes. But if you have enough data and it's homogeneous enough, you can capture the critical window even, so the recovery potential that is higher than normal, even one year and a half after the stroke. 
maybe it's good to emphasize that what you've got there is the change change per week of intervention, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah, a very change, conservative yeah. measure. Yeah, yeah. It's change per week over what you can recover. So it's a normalized method. But what is if you but, but but I'm not sure that I'm not sure that I buy the argument though. I mean, I see that the curve is steeper at the beginning, of yeah. course. But uh, you know, you can have improvement. I mean, improvement per se does not mean that it's plasticity. Totally. So, so I understand. But right. Let me and so you, and yes, so yeah, you need you need to see whether there yes, is the, the I, decay yes, afterwards totally. to show that there is the critical. Yeah, I didn't I didn't spend the time. But let me let me explain you. But I agree absolutely. So okay. So imagine that here is your vertebrae. Okay. So I'm recruiting. You get a stroke. I'm recruiting. Happy happy birthday. Let's say that I'm recruiting people and exposing them to a piano lesson. Okay. Or two months of piano playing. And I'm writing down when it, when is their bed, their birthday, right? So some people I will recruit in January. And they read it was last November. Some people I will recruit in November, and they read it was last February. Okay, and then I say, okay, so this guy had the birthday three months ago. And the question is, will people learn more or less piano depending on when was their birthday? Okay, that's the hypothesis. You would say, not silent. So I would not put my money in that study, right? Because I don't think there is much influence. So here we are putting it in that term, right? But it's not about when was the birthday, it's when was your soul, okay? So why would these people, three years after the soul, recover significantly more or respond significantly more to the piano lesson than these guys that were in a mean of 1.5 years after the soul? If everything closes here during the first six months, What's this the what's the F U F U column? Ah, uh, sorry, this is a follow up, so we use it as a reference. Okay. Yeah, but if if the critical window lasts three months, six months, he, this should be high, and this should be equal, right? Why this recover more than this? They are out of the critical window, right? So why these guys have recovered significantly more than this one? Can't be. But then it's important we distinguish two things, right? On the one hand, the data just tells us something about recovery in terms of performance. Yeah. Right? And we can agree or disagree on that aspect. Yeah. We agree. Even though the data is the data. So I think it's there. Right? Yeah. But then we have the interpretation of the data. And I think this is where the discussion that is going, right? Is do you explain this? Yeah, no, but right? so yes, but, is, is yeah, a, yeah. but but we just keep it apart. No, I agree, right? but uh, they are all improving. No, sure, we agree. But we here right. what we are quantifying is not improvement, it's recovery potential, right? And we are co be, uh, comparing recovery potential between them, and the comparison between them makes us think that something is going on here sure. that doesn't come from the piano lesson only, mm -hmm. right? Because otherwise, if it comes from the piano lesson only, it should be the same. Yeah, so it's an interpretation, of course, we didn't run a dedicated study mm -hmm. To prove that it was kind of a retrospective study, which showed it. But so yeah. in, ideally, you should get at some point late, late, late chronic. At some point, your bar should plateau. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And but when it plateaus, exactly. then you say, "Well, that's when." It that's the, that's when it closes. But right now, we don't know. We don't know when it closes because we are missing here when. Well, for now, we can say it looks open-ended. Well, uh, we cannot say here it's open because we need another group here yeah. that is flat. Right? But okay, but we are beyond 1.5 years. In well, it's not flat. You're going to get recovery, well, but it doesn't yeah. mean that you're making yes, yes. new connections or yeah. new synapses. I, exactly. mean, yeah. I mean, I think as you're training, there is probably re re you know, synaptic yeah. reweighting, yeah, yeah, yeah. functional yeah. connectivity changes, whatever, yeah. but that doesn't mean that it's the same mechanisms exactly. that are. No, I agree. So we would have here something, but uh, it should be significantly lower than this one in order for us to say that these that's guys I are think that's also Belen's point, right? I think you're yeah. saying the same thing, but yes. Belen is pushing the point where she disagrees with me to start with, <laughs> that this recovering brain is deploying different mechanisms yes. than the one we standardly think of in learning and memory. It's yes, yes, and yeah, chronic. You're saying yeah. the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah we did yeah. say the same. Yeah. And 
at Triplo Manual Studies, we see that uh, those that are legion, like after a legion, they you can you can track axonal sprouting, which actually, for instance, in humans, there's also some evidence that there's axonal sprouting after stroke, and this only happens during adolescence. It stops, never happens again. Then you are 65, you have a stroke, and there's again axonal sprouting. Who's triggered this, right? And those are mechanisms that are associated to gain skill that we still cannot decouple from what is learned through exposure to training and what is acquired through mechanisms that are should not be there by then at this age. So that's the that's the now the challenge. Just a question: How do you control here such an exper uh, such a data set for aging, for example? Because I mean, they have a brain damage; they are mm. old. Most yes. of them are yeah. pretty old, and we know that aging at that yes. age yes. also adds a lot of brain damage. Yes. If you have already a stroke, then if you are in a chronic, because we tend yes. tend to treat three, four, five years. Yes. I mean, it may, means a lot to compare a seventy years so old to a seventy-five years old. Yeah, but it's controlled, and that's why I was saying I was emphasizing that this data set is quite new. It's because it's very difficult sometimes to get this plot, but this is not really like time. This is the days when they were recruited, days from stroke. Right, but so if you we recruited all people of the same age because we had the same inclusion criteria for all. No, but you recruit. Uh, you have the inclusion criteria. You usually, say okay, you recruit people from fifty to eighty, for example. Yeah. So that's your inclusion criteria. But then at the end, your time post-stroke will correlate with your age. No, because really. on the average, the, if you have a yeah. randomized trial or randomized yeah. inclusion criteria, your um, average stroke yeah. will happen, let's say, at the age of 65. Mm. So in irrespective of where the group is, unless you explicitly match the groups for age when you yeah. recruit for the days per stroke, otherwise yeah. you will have probably the, a the correlation is not there. Bit of bias. We we check the correlation and we publish this. This is part of the journal neurophysiology, and it has the like it, we are reporting the correlation between age and days per stroke and many other parameters and days per stroke. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, level of function at recruitment at different scales, and the reason why it's not correlated, it should be correlated as you say, mm -hmm. it should be, but the reason why it's not is that we collected this data in a, in a different way. So we were recruiting people at the chronic stage for one study, only chronic. Mm -hmm. For other study, we would recruit acute. Then for another study, again, chronic. So we are trying to keep the same inclusion criteria and recruiting them by, no, 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 I by think, this. I think you're much too nice now because <laughs> I agree with Jurgen. This was our expectation. I expect, we expect some correlation with age, for instance. Maybe just not there because no, you still there, yeah. you still sampled randomly across yeah. the population, right? And you yes. don't see a correlation with age. Yeah. So if, if there would have been one, you certainly should have found it. No, no, we tested, we tested it because time. age yeah. it's it's really like a, it would be a confounding factor to it. And also we tested, for instance, we tested for level of impairment. You would you would expect that people at the more chronic status they have less impairment than people at the acute status. But it's not our case, and that's weird, and that's why our data set is so unique. Because we're recruiting people with the same level of impairment at the acute and at the chronic stage. Because it's different studies with the same inclusion criteria, right? So that's unique, that's very difficult to find. Because if you follow a patient from the acute to the late chronic stage, it will recover. So you would have a correlation between level of impairment at recruitment and days for stroke at recruitment. This is if you would Collect the data in a in a normal like study. I'm sorry, I'm a bit confused as well. Like Modish was saying about the the, the, the purple is follow up of the same individuals at a later time point, or yeah, the FU is follow up after discharge, uh, non treatment anymore. Okay. So yeah. It's non -treatment. So after period of non. -treatment. Okay. So y for now, you don't have data, and what this improvement for the say the early chronic is long term. Uh, no, we don't have long term. We have like uh, some of these acutes, for instance, would do three months treatment or one month and a half treatment, and then uh, they would have a follow up of three more months or six months. Because and then we don't see these patients anymore. There's, there's work that came out recently that uh, from the Queen Square Stroke Group. Ah, yes. Yes, yes. the right, the upper limb 
yes. uh, so that I mean it they basically as well saying that at least early chronic because I think they're, they're about 18 months or so uh, yes. so 18 months yes, right. that they have a three week intense rehabilitation yes. program which improves their upper limb yes. and is maintained for like, six months or so and then yes. problems with the aspirational study. yes it's very aspirational yes but yeah, yeah like well uh, the, the, the study has good intentions I think but the person, <laughs> no but like it's nice because they they try to go like not scientific at all and just like let's give everything we can to these people right like no resources limitations anything uh, in the paper you can see that uh, there's n it's not described in user criteria they didn't describe it they, they didn't apply it uh, they do not describe the treatment and there's no control group and they Plus, they're not clear about the period post-stroke, right? So we don't even yeah. know whether the chronic. So are, well, right? we no, know because could. we are uh, looking at it and so on. So they are including acutes and they are including chronic and subacutes. They are putting them all in the same box. And in the paper, they are already reporting the median and so on, uh, interval. But we see that if this is the case, then it's very difficult to measure. Right, if a therapy is effective and recovery, if you don't cluster them according to chronic, because of all the plastic mechanisms that are taking place and are maybe not related to the effect of the therapy. So we have many questions, and Belen has discussed this with Nick Ward. Yeah. So now we finally have received their data, and we will apply the same yeah. kind of analysis now so to their data. Okay. Yeah, we are yeah. doing now, now that. So we are going to put it in, in this shape using a bootstrapping uh, method for correcting for the uh, gaps in the data, and then for getting more uh, accuracy in the in getting the statistical difference between the classes. So we are working now with Nick's data to do that. But there's another problem with Nick's study, which is uh, which I find annoying, because if you say, look, we do three weeks, we throw everything at these people, including the kitchen sink, like what was it, thirty hours a week of rehabilitation? Yeah, it's, 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 it's ninety. It's, it's yeah. ninety hours. So, so it's. So it's yeah, in three weeks. Here, we're not going to tell you what they do. <coughs> you, you know, no one can do this practically. No one can ever do this as a real treatment, right? And that I find them misleading because people might read this with hope, like, oh, yeah. you know, then no, we're going to get this kind of treatment. Yeah. And this is this is problematic uh, because but, yeah. at least we should try to understand <laughs> what what's yeah. the, the, the the factor that contributes to this, right? Yeah. That, that we can see how can we pull this out. Like in this in this case, and Belinda emphasized that. Most of these patients is like three week, three times a week, twenty minutes, which is peanuts, and these are the effects, right? Because I think we're pushing the right buttons. <coughs> right? So, right. but it's important we we test interventions that we know we can scale. Mm. Yeah. So th this is the kind of discussion we're having. Yeah. I mean, the, the, I think it's a, a proof of concept what they've done. That yes. you know, yeah. can you through brute force perhaps? Yeah. Produce some change, why not sure. that stroke expert? Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, uh, well, I, I, I think is the throwing the kitchen sink approach and see what's the upper limit of what you can get out, mm -hmm. and then you can go back. But you're right yeah. that if they're recruiting at different time points, then it's difficult yeah. to. Uh, but it's true that I think it's valuable what he did in, in some way. I agree with Paul that scientifically, it's, it's not bringing principles, and these are now very difficult difficult to scale for him or to continue his work. Mm -hmm. But something valuable I find in his study is that he's showing very good results. Mm -hmm. So if you really would be able to do everything, then it seems he you can you can raise the asymptote of this control group. I mean, but look, I don't agree. I'm sorry. But okay, there's no control group, so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Why, why do we have scientific methods? Yeah, yeah, I know. Because we want to have valid knowledge so that we can yeah. make statements that mean something. Yeah. If you violate all these methodological rules that we try yeah. to adhere to and then have a conclusion, I mean, it, yeah. sorry, it's just a problem. And it's, the intentions are yes. great and stuff happens, but all of it is okay, stuff yes. happens in Pink Square. Because the other the other kind of monkey wrench in this whole story here is you know the Catherine Lang. Yeah. Uh, task uh, duration study. So this yeah. is a very well controlled study of uh, constraint used, mm -hmm. right? And 
uh, the people were basically constrained lightly and they were doing uh, whatever they like to do for uh, 10 hours or 12 hours a week. I mean, a lot of... And then she also had, had the dose response effect where people were staying in the trial for, I don't know, six weeks, mm. nine weeks, up to, you know, we're talking tens of thousands of hours. So mm. there is a, a sizable group of people that did many, many, many trials. Yeah. And basically she didn't find any yeah. dose response effect, yeah. nothing. Yeah. I mean, so the fact that you're practicing more, yeah. even with variety of different tasks. So again, that really tells that it yeah. is not everything. I yeah, mean, you need to really select the right button, and, uh, and yes. you know, and it's not clear yes. what the right buttons are. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, but this that is should be our discussion. You see, and with mixed results, we don't even have this discussion. Like yeah. Also, I can imagine everything. that the bias is here to your clinic is only run is running one huge study because it was a lot of investment where there's no control group. Your staff knows who is following the study because it was everybody. Like, and they were doing a lot of, like, it was a big team work, like, like giving all these studies to the people. And then you have to evaluate with who admire how much you improve. And so you're obviously biased. So I think it's interesting what he is putting over the table, the proposal, but uh, now we have to do it properly to show it. So I agree, I agree. It's a certain value. I keep saying it has certain value, but. You're it's, a nice person. I, it's no. good, but I'm not. Okay, so the last thing, and I mentioned it very briefly, and then I finish, for to convince you that vision brains work differently, and to convince you that this critical window we are talking about is not as brief as literature said, okay? And it's what we want to change. And one proof of that is that um, we did a, a study some years ago in which we exposed stroke patients to our system at home. And some of, of these uh, patients, um, after three weeks only of treatment, followed a procedure for measuring corticospinal connectivity and changes, structural changes, changes in uh, primary motor cortex. Okay. And for this, we used uh, navigated brain stimulation, which combines uh, MRI for localization and tracing of the map of the, of the cortex with PMS, which stimulates. Uh, around certain area, it's combined with uh, ENG that is collecting uh, motor box potentials. So what this method is doing is uh, applying all these techniques to trace maps, maps that are representing in primary motor areas certain muscles. And we went for two muscles. One was the external uh, ex extensor radialis that is controlling the extension of the wrist. And the other one is uh, the abductor pollicis brevis that is controlling the abduction of the thumb. Okay, so we go for these two only muscles, and we train them for three consecutive weeks in an upper limb uh, scenario of the rehabilitation gaming system that consists in both distal movements that involve grabbing and proximal movements of lunge. And now we measure how the cortex uh, reorganizes. First, we quantify. Uh, the connectivity uh, between uh, the corticospinal connectivity. And we see that for the extensor radialis, there is uh, no increase significantly between the pre. Just laser pointer over there. Sorry, between the pre and the post. And for the abductor pollicis brevis that was controlling the abduction of the thumb, we see a significant increase. So there was higher motor evoked potentials when stimulating through PMS the maps representing this muscle in primary cortex, only three weeks after uh, treatment, right? And then for the representation of the uh, these areas in the primary cortex, what we see is that there is a, a displacement of these maps that we can quantify. This has been actually reported previously by Lieber uh, years ago in constraint induced therapy, very intense therapy for many weeks. And we are able to capture the same results he got three weeks after treatment of the upper limbs. And, what, and we are able to capture it. He, he did the same, but he correlated this displacement of maps with a scale that is not very high res. It's, it's the centroid of the map. That yeah, it's the centroid, right? it's the centroid, the centroid of the map. Moves, yeah. So the, the map that is representing the muscle moves in the cortex. Okay. So he 
found a correlation between how much these knots move after treatment with constraint movement therapy or very, very intense therapy. He correlated this with a scale that is called MAL. It's very low res, right? It's quite poor, you know, based on a questionnaire. Okay? So we did the same, we captured the same with a Tubal minor that is a, a scale for structure recovery chain, which in, includes reflexes, uh, range of movement, okay, um, also strength. And we also correlated it with Kahai, which is a scale that uh, captures recovery in, in function. So um, it, it captures recovery in how these patients are performing activities of daily living. Okay, so we are able to find significant correlations between those uh, structural changes and behavior. Okay, and these patients were chronic. So I hope I convinced you that uh, at any stage post stroke, it seems that these patients have potential for recovery, and we can see recovery in corticospinal excitability. So it's, it, we, we can see markers of induced cellular recovery. Also at the cortical level, with cortical reorganization markers. And yeah, I think now we can go for uh, Casey maybe, and the recovery briefly. I yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, yes, the other two minutes. Okay. That's just the appetizer for lunch, the sure. Casey uh, yeah. treatment. I, I don't know who this person is in the time of the few minutes. <laughs> well, give the highlights. <laughs> Because you're going to spend more time on this next week, Claudia, right? Yes, that was the plan. Yeah. Everybody was but there. I think what is nice to illustrate, just just to show that if you combine this sort of action-oriented intervention with language rehabilitation, yes. that you really boost recovery. If you can illustrate that, I think that's the okay, thing you want to show, right? Yeah. slides here on your aphasia treatment, one with the protocol and the other one with the main result. Is that what you mean? Because then we can just plug that in. Yeah, but was that with one more try maybe? Let's see. Because I have time. Yeah. Okay. No, I'm not sure, but if it's possible, I don't know what's going on. Uh, okay. Thank you. 
So, uh, okay. So basically, we looked at aphasia, and in particular, we looked at uh, local aphasia, which is uh, a disorder um, that happens when you have a lesion in the in your temporal lobe. And so often it's also accompanied by, by disorders in motor functions of the uh, right uh, side of the body. And this non-fluent aphasia in particular is, um, it, it, it characterizes itself by, by defects of lexical access. So the patients would have difficulties in accessing words, accessing structures. Uh, they would not be able to uh, say the words uh, fluently. So there would be some assertive syllabification. But these general fluency and disorder of syntax and, and so on and so forth, so you might be familiar with that. So we have certain problems. Many of so patients, around one third of so patients remain uh, uh, has an aphasia, and 20% uh, of them remain uh, clogged. So uh, so exactly similar as in the context of motor rehabilitation, we have these compensatory mechanisms, right? So we would learn not to use the language, we would point and so on and so forth. So we really need therapy and we really need uh, uh, ways to 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 induce recovery in those patients, and uh, so if we look at the basic rehabilitation, uh, if we go to the hospital in Spain, let's see, let's say we we see that there is uh, the patient, uh, the, the normal conventional normal standard therapy includes the patient and the therapist, and this is about fourteen weeks uh, a week, and this happens until the certain time, and then the patients are discharged and they normally not use language, right? So. Um, so this is what's the protocol, and they are training naming, they are training syllabification, they are training. Um, the, there are the, the, the scenario is not very goal oriented, and there is not much exchange. So this language that they are practicing is not really the language that we speak every day. Right? Uh, there is though one therapy that is called the intensive language action therapy uh, that was developed in Germany by uh, by Dr. Kubermuller. Uh, where patients are training language in the context of um, of a game of so which includes very it's, it's behaviorally relevant it includes interaction um, and so it's goal oriented uh, and which also uh, includes uh, the the use of, of of the motor system right so I don't know here I don't have this slide so I don't yeah but uh, I'm going to explain it briefly basically what what was found is that language needs to be independent of other, uh, let's say, cognitive functions, right? And uh, later, our studies now have shown, well, many studies have shown now that uh, that actually language function is tightly coupled to the motor system. So uh, we have bidirectional connections between uh, broken area, let's say, and the, and the, and the motor cortex. Uh, for example, when we say action words, right, when I say the words that are related to the action of hands, like the words to wave or the words to kick or uh, or clap, uh, we would have the somatocortical uh, activity in the motor cortex related to the hand while I'm speaking. So I don't have to speak for my motor cortex to be active. active. And as well, when um, when I'm moving, uh, so when I'm when I'm waving with my hand or when I'm making actions uh, with hand, foot, or with my mouth, then we would have the broken area. So we see this bidirectional and then data for the uh, This is like so. The, the, the principles of, of language rehabilitation in this context, of course, um, are based on are very related to those of motor rehabilitation. That is, uh, we have we need to have the structure and and, and uh, to, to be able to, to, to recover and to retain uh, the function. Uh, but of course, now in terms of language itself, we found that that there needs to be some motor activity related to this and set certain level of multimodality for the language therapy to be effective. Because indeed those, this intensive language therapy has been shown to be, uh, uh, to have higher scores in the recovery, both after uh, after the treatment and uh, as the follow-up um, compared to the standard therapy. <coughs> so we wanted to integrate those principles uh, of, uh, of the intensive language action therapy, and not only this, but also to extend them uh, by integrating multimodal cues, that is the visual cues and the sounds of the words that the patients would be uh, would be speaking, to see what's the effects and compare this to the standard treatment here in Spain in, in Tarragona. 
And so the, the system itself is our system that is used in, for, for the uh, recovery of normal functions and, and, and cognitive functions. But here, uh, for a change, we're going to have two patients playing uh, with each other. So imagine that in a therapy ward, we have one patient play, placing the computer screen, the other patient, place, uh, patient placing the computer screen. And as well, we have the kinect that captures the movement of the, uh, of the patients. And here, both of them would be presented uh, some three-dimensional objects. And the goal of the game would be to select those objects for request, and then verbally request them from the opponent. So the, the idea would be that every patient has to get as many objects as possible. So, um, uh, exactly. And in half of the stimuli, the, the objects would, uh, would have certain sounds. So, for example, if I have a dog, if I, if I uh, score, uh, if I want to say, dog or request it from another uh, player, then it would have the sound of barking and so on and so forth. And also we presented loops uh, showing the articulation of these words, uh, so in several cases, right? So we have this multimodality, we added this modality, multimodality, we want to understand what's the effect on, on the interaction time, that is the time between I, what, the, the time between the interval when I select the object and I actually receive it from the opponent. Um, so in brief, it was a virtual, um, virtual reality based game which was embodied because we had this avatar and the movement of the avatar followed uh, the movement of my own hands uh, and uh, we would uh, exactly promote this uh, simultaneous use of, of, of language as well as uh, as well as motor function as, as, as suggested it's dyadic so so it promotes the social interaction right we have here two patients playing against each other and there is uh, just a supervision of the therapist uh, who doesn't provide any or therapeutic use, uh, but it's rather um, supervising the, the session. And then uh, these patients would receive this treatment for 30 to 40 minutes a day, uh, every day during two months. And we are measuring uh, the uh, we are measuring the um, language function um, at baseline. Then at month one, two, that is the end of the treatment, and then uh, at the follow up, that is two months after the end of the therapy. Uh, and uh, we're basically <coughs> skipping the results now, no basic results, as, as the, the, the fundamental results would say. So uh, this is improvement on the Boston Diagnostic Behavior Examination. These are chronic patients or acute patients? These are all chronic patients, that is six months for stroke. Uh, and we have uh, nine uh, patients in the our group and uh, eight in the experimental group. So I go in the standard therapy that I didn't mention, underwent exactly the same uh, intensity treatment. So they did the same intensity and they used the same material. Um, and um, <coughs> so uh, the control uh, group is the pilot one and the experimental group is our uh, RGS aphasia uh, group. <coughs> and here we're looking at the group effect. So if you see at one month post, uh, one month post uh, intervention, we uh, see no effects. However, at both month two and three, uh, the whole group improved. And then, if we <coughs> look at those changes, uh, if we split the groups into the into two, uh, we see that uh, while both groups, so both the standard treatment and our treatment, improves at the end of the intervention, only uh, only. Uh, the experimental group uh, retains significantly <coughs> retains those changes, right? So this is this is uh, a great result uh, because we can show that a therapy uh, that is done by two uh, patients individually, right? We, we need to bear in mind that in, in in our group this was a language game where patients were playing against each other or being only supervised. Uh, we promoted uh, a similar level of uh, of a change. Uh, from baseline that is standard therapy, which is done by uh, a professional therapist, not right, language therapy. Uh, and, um, and not only this, but also uh, at two months after uh, the end of the treatment when patients were not receiving any type of therapy, uh, the experimental group uh, actually retained <coughs> those changes significantly. So, uh, so I think this is great news. Uh, and it also speaks to Brian's observation earlier how activity modulates memory, right? Yeah. So in some sense, you give another angle on this now, yeah. 
that. Which is also linking this, let's say, this confluence of motor cortical networks and language networks, right? So I think this Definitely. is an important principle that, that we see emerging here in this exactly. driving of these interventions. Yes, absolutely, yes. Sorry, so, so, sorry, Claudia, I wasn't entirely sure that what are the, the difference between the experimental and the control group? So the, the, does the control group also have the embodied aspect or...? No, the, 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 so the control group is undergoing a standard therapy patient uh, right. with a therapist and they are having uh, the name, name of the patient, the standard right. language therapy of the center. So you're not a, you, you can't dissociate whether it's the, the, the no. good thing here is the embodied or the dyadic no. aspect? Uh, so we don't know, so we, we have a lot of, uh, or multimodal as well, right, because embodied, yeah, exactly, in, 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 also it implies this multimodality, we induce this multimodal cue with the sound. There was, uh, there's a social component of the peer component, let's say, right? So there's not only, we cannot uh, be systematically understand yet what are the components that, uh, that accounted for the changes. And I think this is the, now the, the next step, and this is the most important step, right, for us to understand, and also, as Belen mentioned before, to be understanding who needs what, and until what time, so when is the peer transmission cycle for, for, for whom, regarding what parameter, right, because of course, these patients also come under uh, have disorders of motor functions, and embodiment as well, as there might be a disorder as such, and, and so on. So, um, so, so the integrated uh, system, uh, has a positive effect on, on 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 recovery and retention, whatever the exact parameter is, is is to be uh, uh, investigated. Right, and then I have a. Can, can I make a kind of a general comment for the three presentation? I think this is a problem in the field. Is you know you're emphasizing, and I think this is a very nice study. Of course, the results are, are very interesting. You're emphasizing the mean difference between the control group and the experimental group. Right? So that the experimental group has a higher mean in recovery than the control group. But in all three studies, and I think this is true, I think whenever you're comp comparing a control group and an experimental group, the standard errors are much larger than the mean differences. Okay, So the variability across subjects right. is much larger. And this is true in the cognitive study, and it's also true in the motor study, and it's true across all studies. Okay. So it seems to me that if you know one step maybe in, in that direction would be to start using some of the brain biomarkers to try to first differentiate across all these patients which one are the ones that are going to improve no matter what is the treatment and which one they're not improving. And I think if you have a standard structural lesion like an MRI on this subject or a CT scan, you can start looking at that issue uh, by comparing, for instance, doing either multivariate analysis on the lesion, but maybe more interestingly looking at disconnection patterns, which can be either structural disconnection or functional disconnection, trying to map out what is the source of this variability. And I think yeah. this is key because, because again, and this is true in medicine, right? Yeah, in yeah, medicine, yeah. the selection of the patient for drug trials, for any kind of trial, is the fact that the standard errors are huge yeah. and the mean effect are small. And, and I think so, I think as a goal in the field, we need to start doing patient selection before the trial and, you know, and understand what is the source of this variability, which it seems to be kind of facing us in all, in all the presentation, in all the trials that are done in the, and I think now we can add these biomarkers. So if I take all your lesions and I do a structural disconnectome of those lesions, and we divide those that have better recovery across the techniques, and those that do not show any recovery, there must be a difference there. Yeah. And I think that's kind of could be really but interesting to try. But maybe the difference is not visible with uh, like sectional isolation. You know, well, you can do a cross sectionally too. Yeah. Well, but these are chronic patients, and some of them recover, some of them don't recover. And so the question is, you know, what, 
what is the difference in the neuroanatomy of those huge standard errors that you see? That's what I'm asking, and I think that would be very interesting to know. But Maurice, I think, but I think there are two issues here we should we should uh, separate because we often, in some sense, we have mastered this variability because also here what we're plotting is changes on scales. Yeah. So the variability we're looking at is is in a in a normalized sense, right? Yes. Normalized. So well, some people recover a lot, and some people don't recover right. at all. But on the average, people recover. Okay. Yes, but. but but your size effect, your effect size, yeah. should be much bigger if you can, if you know what is the source of that variability. Wait, wait, wait. I agree with you. We can do right. better. So you, I we mean, can do better, right? We can do better. But I think in the in the clinical literature so far, variability would sort of drown out any effect. Yeah. Right. This is a big problem. That's right. And and so that they have to solve. And and I think one contribution that we made here. Is by having more sensitivity in, in let's say, assessment blah blah blah. I, li I like the trial. We're trying to no, see, you know, uh, we, what we, we, agree, what okay? we can do next, right? Exactly. Because if you want to go to the Spanish government and says, I want to do this gaming, okay, you want to say, okay, what's the effect size of your trial? And your effect size here is in the mo small range. To do a coin analysis on this is going to be like 0 0.4, 0 0.5 if you're lucky. What I'm saying is that if we understand the source of the variability and you do the trial only in the people that you know they're going to recover, now the Cohen size effect is going to be 1.2. I think you yeah, know. We agree, but I see that these are also separate exercises that we have to push. Yes, forward. yes, but 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 it is, but yes, but at, at this stage, almost is important that people are doing speech therapy and they're doing this more interesting and more kind of multidisciplinary and multi, but I think it's as important, which is kind of the point that I tried to make in my presentation, that we need to understand what is the source of the variability for, across subjects, sure. irrespective yeah, of therapy, absolutely. which then will help us in creating better therapies, sure. I think. No, no, you're right. Stronger effects. Yeah, that's really nice. I but mean, the good news is, blood, I think yeah. Yeah. but the good news is twofold. <laughs> there are actually about 50 samples across Europe using this every day. Every day we treat dozens of patients somewhere. Okay, well, so in that sense, effect sizes we have are apparently... Let's do a lesion analysis. No, no, sure. <laughs> and, no, we have to. And the second bit of good news is we don't have lunch. So I want to say...